Hi everyone, how are you? I'm just tipping the screen down so I'm not distracted. Hannah's over there and I'm glad you could join us tonight. So I'm going to talk to you about what to do when disaster strikes. I think I'm perhaps a bit of an expert in what to do when disaster strikes because when disaster struck us, it wasn't just a little disaster, it was a mammoth life-altering, huge, overwhelming bunch of circumstances that changed our lives completely. I'm not complaining about that because it changed them, I'm sure, for the better. But at the time, it was stressful and it was hard to go through. For those of you who don't know, back in 1993, so yeah, we're going back a long way, Back in 1993, I had a part-time job and Wayne was working. We had um, two little boys, one years old and two years old. We had an older home that we compromised on because if it had been up to me, I would have liked a complete and utter wreck that we could just tear apart and rebuild. It would have been, you know, Restoration Australia on our scale. So we compromised and we got the older home that was moving ready with just a few things that we could do to put our own touches on it. One of the things we wanted to do was extend because it was very small. It was um, built just after the Second World War. So it was just the three bedrooms, one bathroom, a kitchen and a lounge room. That was it. The laundry was outside and um, I would have killed for an inside laundry. <laughs> So we wanted to do all those sorts of things, bring in the laundry, extend, give us more living space, that sort of thing. And we'd almost, we had decided what we we're going to do. We'd started saving for it and I lost my job quite unexpectedly on the Thursday. So it was a bit of a, we don't need you anymore. Thank you for your efforts. It's been nice knowing you, see you later sort of thing. And that was fine. I figured that we would survive. We talked about it. And yes, well, it was a bit disappointing because we were hoping to use my money to do the renovations and the extensions and buy what we needed. We'd manage until I found something else. But then on Friday, which was the next day, I went into town, I took the boys and went into town and I went to the bank to get my housekeeping money, which I always got the grocery money in cash in those days. And there was so much money in our bank account that I was stunned and I actually went into the bank and asked. They said, no, no, it's definitely yours. I, we, I was there for ages in the bank, making them check and double check and triple check and quadruple check. No, definitely it's right. The right account had been put into the right account. Oh, my goodness, I didn't know what to do. So I went straight around to where Wayne worked and he was just coming out the door as I pulled up out the back. And he just said, I've been retrenched, I've lost my job. And that's what the extra money was in the bank account. Oh, my goodness. That sort of threw a spanner in the works for us because we certainly were planning on going from two incomes to no income. So being the um, worrier that I am, I spent all weekend worrying myself sick, so I thought, and I was ill. I was violently ill all weekend. Monday morning, he dragged me out of bed and took me to the doctor and I wasn't sick. I was pregnant and we were expecting, well, surprisingly, is that a word? Surprisingly, we were expecting Hannah. She was our little disaster baby it's not such a disaster but anyway so that really threw a spanner in the works because we had no jobs a mortgage to pay a house that was half dismantled ready to extend and renovate and a baby on the way so i i wish i could be um smug or something and say that i just naturally took over and knew what to do and life was rosy after that. But that's not true because I, I didn't know what to do. I It was all I could do at that stage 
to get up, get the boys dressed and fed, put the washing on the line and go back to bed because I was really unwell for ages. I was really unwell. We were using our savings to live off. Uh, we had gone to Centrelink and that was a very disappointing, from my point of view, really disappointing um, experience and one I vowed then and then never to repeat and I've not had anything to do with Centrelink since, simply because we had money in the bank. So because we had money in the bank, we had to use that up before we could get or before Wayne could claim any unemployment benefits. Now, it didn't matter that at that stage we had both worked from 15 and so we had nearly 40 years of working between us, more than 40 years of working between us and paying taxes and never drawing back off our social security system. That didn't matter. The girl, the girl we spoke to was lovely. She was absolutely lovely. And she told me, you know, look, she understood my problem. She understood why I was upset. And she did say to me, if we were to go to the bank on the way home, take out all our money, leave 10 or $20 in the account, go back the next morning and get a statement with that balance on it and take it to her, she'd be able to help us. And that stunned me because that was so dishonest. We talk about people rotting the system all the time. And she was pretty much telling us the only way she could help us was if we rorted the system. So I got my back up and said, no, in not quite so polite a way. I said, no, and we wouldn't do it. And so we struggled and we struggled because back in 1993, interest rates were really high. Young people with mortgages these days do not know what it was like, but we were paying, we were paying 18% on our mortgage we had friends paying 21% on their mortgage. And your mortgage payments, you were getting deeper into debt. The more you paid off, the more you owed, it seemed like it was a horrible time. And not just for us, but for the thousands of Australians with mortgages during that time. It was just awful. And I would hope that we never get back to that. But that meant that we had to have money coming in so being pregnant, there wasn't much I could do in terms of getting a full-time permanent job because that just wasn't going to happen. So we decided I would stay home, would look after the boys, have the baby, do what I could to save money, and Wayne took whatever work he could get. Now, he drove tractors and ploughed paddocks. He um, baled hay. He picked potatoes. He picked strawberries. He pruned trees. He um, got casual work at a feedlot out of town and he would get up at 2.30 in the morning and drive out there for a 3 o'clock start and it would be minus 4 or minus 5 and he'd be out there feeding the cows and he'd do that and then he'd come home and have a bit of a rest, a bit of lunch and he'd go back and he'd do contract work with the council on roadworks. He did whatever he could, fencing, whatever he could. I did some mending, whatever I could do. I did ironing, all sorts of things we did to earn a living during that time, just enough, and it was just enough to pay our bills. Now, we didn't actually need any more. All we needed was enough to pay the mortgage and the bills. Any more was icing on the cake. So in hindsight, you know, God was good and he gave us, he met our needs. We didn't go hungry, we didn't go cold, we didn't, you know, go naked. Um, so we managed. We sold a car, so we went back to being a one-car family. I learned how to um, cook properly. So that was one really good thing that came out of this time. I actually learned how to cook, which isn't to say I couldn't cook before. I could do a six-course dinner for 12 like that, but putting an ordinary meal on the table for the, for the four of us just dinner every night was almost beyond me. It was too simple and I couldn't quite get my head around it. So I've always enjoyed um, what Wayne calls fancy cooking. I like, you know, doing for the parties and, and things like that. I love doing that. But 
ordinary everyday meals were almost beyond me. So I learned to cook. I learned to bake. I learned to make jam. Who knew it was so simple? I learned to make sauce. Again, who knew it was so simple? I learned, um, I got my mum to come up because mum at that stage was 460 kilometres away from me. I got mum to come up and show me how to bottle fruit. Now, I had always done that with her in her kitchen from my, when I was a very little girl. Mum has always done that. But watching isn't quite the same as doing it for the first time. So I got mum to come up and show me what to do. Who knew it was so easy? Go figure. All those things. I learned how to write a shopping list. I learned how to write a shopping list and stick to it. And as I explained last week, that became um, the basis of my price book, my very first price book. But I learned how to shop properly. I learned how to what I learned how to buy meat, what cuts to buy that were the best value, not necessarily the cheapest, but the best value which ones would go further. I learned how to stretch those meals. I learned how to sew. I learned how to knit. I learned how to crochet. I learned how to do so many things when disaster struck. And that did pretty much change our lives. So we had no money coming in. We had money in the bank and we had to make it last. The most important things for me at that time were paying mortgage and getting food on the table. Anything else I could figure out. You know, if we didn't have electricity, well, we just light candles. If we didn't have um, water, we'd borrow from the neighbours. I don't know what we would have done. But they were the most the food and paying the mortgage were the two most important things to us. So we sat down and we actually worked out what our priorities were in order. So mortgage, food, then the utilities, um, petrol for the car, then the insurance and registration. And after that, anything else was a want and not need. So clothes, shoes, toys, hairdressing, entertainment, eating out. If it wasn't free, we didn't do it. Um, if we couldn't walk to it most of the time, we didn't do it because we didn't want to waste the petrol or use the petrol. We had a very tight budget. $50 a fortnight was what I budgeted for fuel. So we had to make it last. So we did those things and we moved to a cash budget. Best thing ever. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're not going to have an income, but you still have the bills to pay, move to a cash budget. Put the credit card away. Put the debit card away, same deal. Move to a cash budget. I would go to the bank once a fortnight. I would get out the money we needed, take it home, and I had envelopes in those days, and they were all worked out, and I'd put the money in the envelopes, put the envelopes in a drawer in our bedroom, and as I was doing whatever, petrol money, grocery money, milk money, whatever, I'd get it out of the envelope. And once it was gone, that was it until the next fortnight. It may sound um, hard. And I suppose for a little while it was difficult. It was training myself to do things differently that was probably the biggest challenge at that time not necessarily all the things that were going on but training myself to do things differently so where I'd been used to just going down the street buying what we needed and then at the end of the month paying the bills I couldn't do that anymore I had to stop and think about what we needed was it really a need or was it a want did I have something that would do the same job in which case I didn't need to buy it. Could I borrow it from someone if it was a tool or similar? Could I borrow it from someone? And I borrowed cake tins. I borrowed garden tools. Wayne borrowed tools to work on the car, all sorts of things, if we could, because we just didn't have the money to do anything else. 
out of all that, though, I didn't want our lifestyle to change. It did drastically, but I didn't want to not do the things that we really enjoyed. So, again, we sat down and we worked out what was really important to us in terms of our lifestyle and the things that weren't really important to us. And I've said this for, I've been saying this for 26 years, we just made the decision to ditch the stuff that wasn't important to us so we'd have the money to enjoy the things that were. And that's what we did. So if you find yourself in that situation, perhaps sit down and decide what's really important to you. We decided that we didn't need to go to the club every week for dinner. We didn't need to go to the movies. We didn't need to um, get takeaway pizza after shopping. We didn't need to have fish and chips on a Friday night because it was just a habit. We didn't need to do those things. They were just things that we did. They weren't important to us. So we ditched them, which automatically freed up an awful lot of money that we had otherwise been spending and that we couldn't at that time then afford. So think about that. And if you find yourself in this situation, think about the things that are important to you, what are really important, list them in order of priority and take it from there. Get your cash out of the bank once or twice a month and work on a cash budget. Honestly, there's nothing more eye-opening than a cash budget. When you know you've only got $50 in your purse and it has to last you for a month and you need to do buy milk and bread for a month with that $50, you will be very careful about how you use it. But even more importantly, you'll become very mindful of what you waste at home. Australians waste an awful lot of food. I think the last time I checked, I think it was roughly 18, the average was $1,800 per person per year of perfectly good food that got wasted because it would be put in the fridge and forgotten about it until it went furry or it would be bought and put in the freezer and left to go to freeze burn or they'd bring it home and decide they didn't like it. It was all wasted. That's money that you don't, you can't afford. If you've got no money coming in, you can't afford to waste food. So you become very mindful of what you're doing. So leftovers don't become leftovers. They become the start of tomorrow night's dinner. So the leftover mashed potato I had last night is, is in the fridge and it will go into um, fish cakes for tomorrow night's dinner. It won't be wasted. It would also, if it had been winter, I might have made potato soup with it. Mashed potato makes the best potato soup. So and it, that's really simple because you just need to add an onion and some corn if you've got it and mashed potato and thin it with a little milk or stock, depending on what you've got. Warm it up so it's boiling, but just warm it up and it is just delicious potato soup. So leftovers become, aren't, aren't wasted. You become very conscious of things like that. It's where I learned to water down the shampoo and the conditioner because way back then, not so much these days, but back then I tended to be a bit brand precious and I liked particular brands of things, but they were expensive and so I would dilute them and use less. My hair is usually short anyway, so I don't need a huge amount of shampoo. Wayne has short hair. The boys at that stage would have little tiny heads. They were only babies. So we didn't need a lot. And diluting it, I discovered it still works. That's when I decided I'd try diluting the dishwashing detergent too. And it works just fine. 50-50 with water works just fine. You still get the bubbles, still does the cleaning. You still get the nice... I think I've got strawberry and guava under the sink at the moment. Still get the nice fragrance. Works just fine to clean your dishes, but it halves your cost. Little things like that. So you manage to not just cope, but you actually start to live. And we found that we were we were actually living. We were more relaxed. We weren't stressing all the time. We weren't rush, certainly weren't rushing all the time because we had to meet so-and-so here or go there or be here. 
we spent more time at home, we spent more time together as a family, we did more things together and we actually finished renovating our house in this time. That was, it cost us under $1,000 to do the renovations. It was a lot of hard work, but it didn't cost us a lot. And that's because we learned to recycle. We had found, Wayne's dad had found, he used to go walking every morning. He had found a house that was being torn down that actually had the same board profile, weatherboards, as our house. And he went, oh, and he actually spoke to the fellow that was doing the demolition and said to him, what, you know, what it, what was he going to do? And they were just going to put them in a dumpster and take them to the tip. So he asked if we could have them and the fellow said we could have whatever we wanted, but it had to be gone by that weekend. We didn't have a hope of getting to Sydney in that weekend. So Wayne's dad and his brother and a cousin went and collected the weatherboards. They got windows, they got the doors, they even got beautiful floorboards, beautiful, beautiful floorboards for us, piled them all up onto Wayne's dad's trailer and brought them down to us. So they cost, oh, and the studs, is that what they called, the studs for the walls, that, you know, hold the plaster up? All we had to buy was plaster, insulation and paint for our, for our extension. There's photos of me somewhere, very pregnant with Hannah, sitting under the magnolia tree in the backyard, pulling um, nails out of the boards. And if the nails were safe, I put them in a pile there. If they were a bit bent, they went into another pile. And if they were really bent, they went into a bucket to go into the bin. And we reused the nails if we could. So it ended up oh, almost doubling the size of the house. I got my inside laundry, yes. And it cost us under $1,000 because literally all we had to buy was the plaster, the insulation and the paint. Everything else came from an old house that was being demolished. And it wouldn't have happened if Wayne's dad hadn't been aware that we didn't have the money, if he hadn't been conscious of the fact that we needed to get this extension finished because I have bowed and declared that until my new kitchen was done, Hannah wasn't being born. <laughs> I really, 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 I had a dishwasher. We put the dishwasher and it was sitting in the box and I was waiting, waiting for that dishwasher to go in. And I said that she's not coming out until that dishwasher goes in. <laughs> and so he was conscious of all of this for us. So he looked out for us as well and it worked, it worked for us. And again, I can say we were blessed with people that were able to help us and willing to help us. And at the, at the time that we needed it, it just happened. We didn't, we didn't suffer. We didn't go without during that time at all. And we finished up our extension. Wayne still managed to get up and go out to the feedlot or go and ro roll roads or, or whatever. And it worked for us. That time also, I think, was the beginning of us having an actual detailed budget. We'd always had a bit of a budget in that money went into the bill account and the bill got paid. But I'd never actually sat down and worked out, you know, the gas, the electricity, the water, council rates, the car insurances, petrol, gifts, um, pharmacy bills, health insurance, all those sorts of things, school fees because once Hannah was born, Alan was in preschool and then we had big school coming up, so we had school fees. And that was one of the things that was a priority for us when we did the ditch it and keep it list was school. And we desperately wanted him to go to a particular school. And so we had to have school fees, we had to have book list, we had to have uniform, all that sort of thing had to be saved up so that he, we'd be able to manage and send him to the school that we wanted him to go to. So we sat down and we wrote a detailed budget, and that was a bit of an eye-opener because we tallied it up. And honestly, there are so many things that we just spent 
money on that really in terms of a written budget in terms of our lifestyle weren't absolutely essential at all and so then we went through and we ditched out the things that we didn't want we extended well we cut down barber fees and i learned we bought a 20 dollars set of clippers from kmart and i did the boys and wayne's hair Sometimes it was really good and sometimes it wasn't so good. But, you know, what do they say? It's only six weeks between a good hair haircut, bad haircut. Hair grows. Um, I extended my haircuts from every four weeks to every eight weeks and I stopped getting it coloured. I'd colour it myself. That's when I figured out I could actually use, because I had short hair, I could actually use half the quantity of the... Um, colour and save it for the next time I needed to do it or to touch up the roots and that helped to um, cut the cost of home hair colours at that stage too. It was it was a learning curve. It was a real learning curve for me, probably not so much for Wayne. And it shouldn't have been because we both came from very frugal families. We didn't come from wealthy families. We didn't come from extravagant families. They were very frugal and you know, my family especially, I grew up, my dad always worked on the cars. He always did things around the house. If it was plumbing or whatever it was, he did it. And mum cooked and sewed and knitted and grew veggies and bottled and did all that sort of thing. So I should have, I should have paid more attention when I was growing up is what I should have done. I should have known how to do those things and I did sort of know how to do them I just never actually had to do them so it was a real learning curve for me to do that when disaster struck when disaster struck one of the things that came out of this though was um, spending more time at home so I only had to car one day a week and on that day I made it um, it was playgroup day or CWA a day. So we'd leave home at half past eight in the morning and we'd race into town and I'd do the banking. Then I'd do whatever other chores I had to do, bills to pay, post office, chemist, whatever it had to be. We'd go to playgroup or CWA, depending on what it was, and then we'd come home. Often, particularly with playgroup, the mothers would go after playgroup, they'd go to McDonald's for lunch. And back then, I think the Happy Meals were like $1.95 or something. But I had to buy two of them and I didn't have that money to spare. So we wouldn't go. And a friend asked me why and I just, I had to be honest, and thought, well, we just can't afford it. And she went, oh, oh. I can't afford it either. She said, we really can't afford it either. I said, fine, so next week, come to our house. And so she made her children's lunches, brought them to our house. The kids played in the backyard. We sat inside and had our sandwich and our coffee or tea and watched out the window and watched the kids in the sand pit and on the swings and whatever and had a really nice time. So the next week at playgroup, they wanted to know where why we hadn't gone to McDonald's and just, well I just said look you know, I, I couldn't afford it it was getting too expensive for me with the two kids and and Wayne not having regular work yada yada so you know we decided to just go back to my place but if they wanted to join us they were welcome to and they did so it used to be we'd go to play group and then everyone would troop back to our house because we had the swings, we had the cubby house, we had the sand pit, the big tree. There were boys had made tracks under the tree for their ponker trucks and things. So it was, and we could sit out under the shade of the tree, get our coffee and watch the kids play and talk. And it was wonderful. It was absolutely blissful. And even better, because they came to our place, this is going to sound, this probably was really mean, but it wasn't at the time because I didn't have, the, if it had been, if we decided to take in turns and go to someone else's house, I may not have been able to go depending on where it was 
because I didn't have the petrol because that's how closely I budgeted our petrol because we were living in the country so everywhere we went was a distance and like every phone call was an STD toll call it cost us a small fortune so I would only ring my mum once a fortnight unless it was an absolute emergency and I would ring her on a Sunday morning as early as possible so that I could get the cheap talk for 20 minutes for I think it was two dollars it was you know that was a big deal and mum would ring me Wayne's mum would ring, ring ring us so it was a really big deal and the petrol was a really big deal too. So having everyone come back to our house was a double blessing for me. It saved me going to McDonald's or having to say, no, we're not going. And it saved me using that petrol. It's, it, it was, I don't want you to think that it was grim, that things were, things were grim, but we weren't grim. We weren't miserable and we didn't feel deprived and we certainly weren't unhappy. We were very focused on, you know, getting money, saving money and that and working on our budget. And that time absolutely made me determined to never, ever, ever not have money to fall back on if disaster struck again. And so it also, are you winding up? <laughs> I thought, <laughs> my ear. thought Hannah was saying, hurry up. That also was the start of me consciously and faithfully saving into an emergency fund. Now, some, some months I might have only been able to put $2 into it, but I did. I put birthday money my mum and Wayne's mum always gave me money for my birthday. I put my birthday money into it. I put Christmas money into it. Um, whatever, if I sold anything, if we had a garage sale and I raised enough money for whatever we needed, the excess went into the emergency fund because I vowed and declared that I would never, 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 ever again not have money to survive if we didn't have an income we have money to survive if we don't have an income we would survive quite well for 12 months I could stretch it out to two years if I had to I have a grocery stockpile now that would feed us for 12 months or longer I'm if I stretch more. it out Hannah says more probably more but if I stretched it out, probably two years we could get out of it if we absolutely had to. So I always say when disaster struck. And at the time it was, it was such a disaster because in the immediate aftermath, I did not know what we were going to do. I shut down for six months. You know, we didn't tell anyone Hannah was on the way until it was obvious and we couldn't hide it anymore. Um, it was, but looking back and looking at what we have now and where we are now, the disaster perhaps wasn't such a disaster in the long term. And that's why when people come to me as, um, one of our members did yesterday and say that she's just been told that she'll lose her job. She's been given two weeks notice and her job will be finished um, and they rely on her money to live off. What will she do? It's why I can say that right now it looks horrible. Right now it's frightening and t t you, your heart's beating and you can't breathe and you are so nervous. But if you stop, take a breath, sit down and think about what's important to you, what's important that you need money for, 
what's important to you in your lifestyle and what's important to you for your future and take it from there, then it's not such a disaster. Now, she will she will end up with, um, she'll have some money, her wages, plus some holiday pay and a payout and whatever. So she'll have a few weeks of income when she finishes up. So they'll, they'll sit down and they'll be able to work it out. And after talking to her and saying, take a breath, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, you know, what can you trim, what don't you need, you know, those sorts of things. Well, if she's not working, they won't have daycare. She was a bit reluctant to give up her daycare place. Then it was a question of, well, do, you do you really want to go back to full-time work? Is there something else you can do? Can you work at home? I have another friend who does typing at home. She puts her babies to bed in the afternoon and while they're having their afternoon sleep, she, she does her work, her paid work. Is there something she can do at home? So she's going to think on all those things. And I hopefully she's feeling better today than she was yesterday because she was very distressed yesterday. But hopefully she's feeling a bit better. And, of course, that's what prompted me to say, look, when disaster strikes, you can get through it. It's not always easy. Someone asked a question um, a few weeks ago, what do you do if you lose your job? Do you sell your house? Why? Aren't there other things? I wouldn't, that would be a last resort for me to sell your house because once you, once you get out of the housing market, it's going to be really hard to get back into it. And if you haven't been in your home very long, you may not have enough equity in it to even break even. If you, um, the market is really soft at the moment, apparently. So selling now is, is not so easy. In fact, we've got quite a few homes around us that have been for sale for months, just not selling. So selling your home should be a last resort, but you do need to stop spending, stop spending straight away. So there will be nothing but groceries and it'll be bare bones groceries, no luxuries. So we'll put back the biscuits and, the, you know, it doesn't matter if they're on half price or not, you put them back. You won't be buying cordial. If you've got to have cordial, you make it. If you want no soft drinks, you'll go from steak to sausages and mints and chicken fillets. You will drastically change things. So no new clothes, no shoes, no hairdressing, no nails, no mani pedis, nothing like that. No going out unless it's free. Uh, taking lunches to work walking instead of driving, there will be huge changes. But they don't have to be forever. Just until you get back onto your feet, just until you find a job if you really want to find another job, whatever. it's not forever. It's just going to be for a short time. And once you are back on your feet, you can start, you know, having steak once a week or, or getting your nails done once a fortnight or whatever it is that you really like to do. Um, but make paying your mortgage a priority. You need to keep your house, by all means, um, ring your gas electricity suppliers and let them know what's happened and see if there's a hardship plan that you can go on to. Um, don't stop paying your bills. Pay your bills, but if you're struggling with that, by all means, contact them. They will help you. They want their money. They don't want to not have their money. They want their money, so they will help you. If you if you are upfront with them in the beginning, they will help you shop around and try and reduce your insurances. Lower them if you need to. Up the um, excess to lower the premium. Do those sorts of things. It might be if you have older children that are into um, activities like sport or art or music, those things might have to go by the wayside for a while 
or you may have to find a cheaper alternative. Start going to your library for free entertainment for the kids and the little little kids in the mornings. Libraries have great free entertainment story time for kids. is brilliant. Um, those sorts of things. And if you are home, you can grow a garden. And don't tell me you don't have a green thumb. You don't need a green thumb. You need a bit of dirt and some seeds and you can grow food. And I will do um, some more videos on the garden later. But you don't need a lot of space. You just do it. Um, so anyway, all of this took us till just after Hannah was born. She was a cute little thing, but she was quite sick when she was born, so that was a bit scary, and it took us a while to recover from that. And then we decided that we were never going to get permanent work where we were, so we moved. Packed up and moved. And we were lucky or fortunate or blessed that my mother had room for us for a while so we lived with grandma for a while and that it was nice I think it was nice for our kids to have grandma close it was good for grandma to have our kids close um, and it helped us re-establish ourselves in a new town it helped Wayne find a job we got kids settled in different schools all that sort of thing and all the while this was happening I had been determined as I said that it wouldn't change our lifestyle. We would still do the things that were important to us. And so people were saying, were asking how we did it because they knew even once we'd moved and Wayne had um, a full-time job, it was really low paying. It was really, really low paying. It's the lowest paid job he's ever had in his life. But it was full-time job. Um, they were asking how we managed what, what we were doing because they couldn't see that our lifestyle had changed so much because we were still well-dressed. We still ate, excuse me, ate well. We still went on holidays, but our holidays were to grandma or granny's house. They weren't to anywhere flash. Uh, we still did things and we had our kids in private school. So they wanted to know how we did it. And so I'd started showing them and I started, the very first thing I started with was muesli bars because I didn't buy muesli bars. I don't think I've ever bought muesli bars. Don't remember. Only for Pathfinders because I had to be wrapped. Oh, okay. Once I bought muesli bars. Um, and I started with muesli bars with the playgroup mums and I just shared my recipe for muesli bars with them. And that was the start of it. So after that it was... How do you do this? Where do you find this? How? What am I going to do with this? What's the best way to use this? Blada, blada, blada. And so I was thinking and thinking and I was sitting one day with Hannah watching, she was on my lap watching TV and this lady on TV and she was talking about something rather old. It's old hat. I do that. There's nothing new in that. I do that. And she said something else. But I already do that. Oh, something else. I already do that. And she was talking about she was going to produce a magazine. And I thought, oh, I could do that. Well, actually, I couldn't because by the time I looked into it, because this was very, very early internet days and I'd never used a computer before. Crikey, when I finished um, office work, we just switched over from plug and cord switchboard. And so we still had the big Burroughs L9000 ledge machine. It was dinosaur days for young people wouldn't know what that is, but it was it was what I used. Email was new, you know, very few people had email accounts. Hotmail was the in thing if you had if you had internet and it was dial up in those days. So I did sit down and I did nut it out and talk to Wayne about it and we tried to work it out. But of course, in those days, because there was no internet, it had to be printed and it had to be posted, and that was a massive job. 
and it was very expensive. And so I went, well, maybe I can't do it. We'll just keep talking at playgroups, spread the word that way, everyone can know, whatever. When we moved, um, I got in touch with some friends, some older friends, and I'm talking to them, and one of them actually said to me, you know that newsletter idea you were talking about? And I went, yes. She said, I think I have a way you can do it. And I went, oh, okay. She said, come over and I'll show you. So I went over and she showed me and I oh, I can do this. I didn't know what a website was. Didn't really understand the internet at all. I still don't. But I didn't really understand the internet at all. I barely understood email. And websites were straight over my head. But she sat me down and she said, now you type this and hit that and type this and hit that and type this and hit that. She said, look, you've just built a website. I went, oh, oh, golly gosh, gee whiz, how does this work? So she sat down and we, we, she showed me how to make pages and how to do put sections on pages and how to throw in a picture and do a pretty heading. And, oh, my giddy up, this is amazing. So I was so excited. I raced home and I rang Wayne and I said, I've just built a website. And he went, oh, that's nice. I was expecting, oh, congratulations, that's wonderful. How oh, hallelujah, our, our problem solved. And, oh, that's nice. That was a bit of a letdown. But anyway, that little single page that I built that day became the very first Cheapskates website. You know, improved a bit before it went live and our website went live in May 2001 all those no May 1999 sorry May 1999 August 2001 is the start of what we have today so exciting so exciting for me to know that I could do a newsletter and send it to so many people without having to stand there and copy and copy and copy and post. And I could do it free. I didn't have to charge anyone for it. I could send it to them or send it to you and it wouldn't cost you anything. That was the most exciting thing for me because I knew that it didn't matter how good it was, if it was going to cost something, I wouldn't have been able to, to afford it. I wouldn't have had the money. Even if it was just $5 a year, I would not have had that money. So to be able to give something just made my heart singing. And it has every Thursday since then. So I send out the weekly newsletter. I hit that send button. I love it. It's so, so good. I love the fact that it goes out free whether you read it or not I don't care but I can send it to you and it doesn't cost you anything and it can sit in your inbox for forever and if you need it it will be there for you that's what I like and that was the start of the cheapskates club way back then we actually became the cheapskates club back in 2005 yes 2005 we changed the name to the cheapskates club and we've grown from there and we still keep growing. Happens. I was working on the website today. There's a whole lot of new stuff in there. So it be fun for you to find it. But it's there. So that's um, pretty much my story. That's where I am today. My latest invention or my latest um, venture is the YouTube lives that I'm loving doing. So there you go. That's my story. That's how... The disaster wasn't such a disaster after all. And I hope that if it ever, you know, if you ever have your own personal disaster, that when you look back on it, it won't be such a disaster after all. It will have been a life-changing moment and just a moment because in the grand scheme of things, in the grand scheme of your lifetime, it's just a little, little tiny blip that really you know, can have such a huge impact. So now who have we got here? Got 
gosh, lots of people today. <sighs> All righty. Oops. What are you doing? I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to say hello. Joe, Diana, Narelle, Julie, Maureen, Outback, Eve, Sharon, Michelle, Catherine, Nola, Dallas, 301 Jules, Katrina, Kath. Oh, it's a great name, isn't it? Um, Julian Rod. Okay. There we go. Oh, poor sister. But she's got a new job, so congratulations to her. All right. Okay. Well, does anyone have any questions? Throw them at me. Capital, so that we know they're a question. They'll stand out. We'll be able to find them. That would be really good. Is it lagging a bit for you? It always lags me. Does it? Oh, sorry. Okay, well, that's not very good. We need to fix that. Well, I mean, there's always a delay. Uh -huh. It's not necessarily lagging. Okay. No questions? I do. Do I look dark? Do you look dark? Yeah. Where? My neck. No? Oh. Any, I ask you if there's any questions and Hannah asks if she looks dark. I'm not thinking. Oh, okay. I'm baking. She's baking. Okay. Oh, a bit darker. Fake tan will do it every time. Okay. So... We thought on Thursday night we'd do scrolls. Hannah thought. What well, Hannah thought, I'd do scrolls. Um, so we'll do cinnamon and pizza scrolls my way, okay, which is really um, easy, simple, fun and yum. So we'll do scrolls on Thursday night which um, freeze really well, folks. Cost hardly anything to make. Freeze really well. Good for school lunches. Good for school lunches. Really nice for morning tea, the cinnamon scrolls. And they warm up really well too. So if you want pizza scrolls and you'd like them warm, they warm really well too. They don't go all um, soggy, which is really good. <laughs> which book did you get, Freya? Scrolls are really good. Thomas, Tom loves scrolls. They're his favourite thing. If I make scrolls, he just hangs around the kitchen until they come out of that oven and he'll burn his fingers as he tries to grab them. So when stockpile, when on, stockpile on my list? I don't know. Um, we can do stockpile next Tuesday if you like. I'm happy to. I'm flexible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wish Maureen. <laughs> she sits there and she waves her hands and she goes like this at me and does this to me and I'm like, wow, I, don't know. I can see it out of the corner of my eye and I don't know what's going on. Eat more. So, eat, oh, beautiful. Okay, yes, so that's a great book to follow. Yeah, the new book will follow on from that with the meal plan so you'll be able to order it um, ahead of time too. Um yeah, you know, I still eighty dollars a week rarely goes over that. Um, it it's easy. It really is easy. Now I had some things that I was going to talk to you about. Can't remember. That wasn't good, was it? Brain like a sieve. Okay. Well, all right. If you haven't subscribed please do, then you'll get notif notified when we've got new shows coming up. Don't forget to hit the thumbs up, please. That really, it really, really does. It helps me, but it helps YouTube know that you like us so it keeps us going. And, of course, share the videos. Share it, share the link to it um, once we're finished and let everyone spread the message, spread the word that, you know, living the cheapskates way isn't sad and it isn't mean and it isn't miserable and you don't go without everything that you love 
and you don't, you know, live in a hovel and it, you just don't. It's, it's a great lifestyle. And so, yes, yes, I do still make washing powder and I made a um, miracle spray last week. I filled my canister up, my dispenser up last week. I do washing powder probably three times a year. And I grate four bars of soap at once, so I quadruple the recipe, and that fills my big tin. And, no, oh, no, maybe not, yeah, maybe twice a year. Depends on how often I wash and what I'm washing. Um, still just the three-level teaspoons um, in the wash. I have a top-loading washing machine. It's supposed to be a high-efficiency one top loader that acts like a front loader or whatever, but that's all I've ever used. Um, if something's a bit grimy or a bit um, stained, I use my um, stain removing soap, give it a rub, dampen it, wet it, give it a rub with the soap and then toss it in the wash and that will get rid of most stains. It's really good on grass stains, really good on grass stains. Um, and on oh, what's that stuff your father uses um, on his work clothes? Um, not the silica, the um, oh, I really have gone, brain's gone mental. Anyway, Wayne uses his powder stuff that is just revolting and sticks to everything in the course of his work. So his clothes come home and he's got it all over him. So I just use that on the stain removing soap on those two, give it a rub, give it a scrub, pop it in the machine, it's done. Sorry, I shouldn't be really putting my hands around, should I? Um, times aren't exceptionally hard anymore. We had a couple of years, we had about 18 months, about two years ago that things weren't so good, but they're not so bad anymore. And, you know, I think once you realise that you can... You can live on a tight budget. You can live well on a tight budget, that you can find other things to do. Nothing seems hard anymore. It, it, you know you can cope. I guess it's a bit like um, the, the, the people that survived the Great Depression and they came out of it and so they were always frugal but they didn't, um, but they weren't mean. You know, there's a big difference between being frugal and being mean. And I think that, you know, when you know that you can manage and you can still do things and still enjoy life on very little, it's, it's really quite freeing because then no matter what life throws at you, you know you'll survive, but you'll survive happily and well. Um, miracle spray. Oh, benches, floors, bath, basin, toilet, shower. Um, we scrubbed the pavers with it a couple of weeks ago. Wayne had the pressure thing out the back. We were cleaning our pavers and I had miracle spray in a bucket of um, water and he was sucking it out with the precious thingy and squirting it onto the pavers. And I was rubbing over them with the um, stiff broom. And then he'd come along with the high pressure thing to clean them up. Worked brilliantly. Um, walls, doors. I've been known to throw it into the washing machine on particularly dirty clothes. So anything that's really stinky like sports clothes, we're coming into football season, so they can be quite gross and muddy and revolting. And I, oh, I used to hate having to do sport, the sports uniforms at school because the kids used to have to do it in a rotation to bring them all home, bring all the uniforms home and to wash them. I hated doing that. Ugh. But, yeah, no, Miracle Spray is brilliant. Fridges to clean out your fridge um, and on the outside of your fridge, cupboards, anything like that. It's really good if you get an odd spot in your carpet. And what I do is I actually put the Miracle Spray onto a microfiber cloth and then dab that onto the spot. I don't spray straight onto the carpet because you don't ever want to soak your carpet. You don't ever want your carpet to get wet. So 
onto the um, cloth and then dab it. Don't rub it because that will peel and your carpet, even if it's it, regardless of whether it's a wool or a synthetic or whatever, it will go all fluffy and horrible. So just dab it, dab, 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 and keep changing it to a clean spot until the spot has gone. And then get a wet, a clean cloth with just water and use it to rinse it out. Does, it does sound strange, Maureen, doesn't it? Maureen said that they had a disaster striking moment in 2005 and looking back it was a huge learning curve and a good thing. When it's happening, it's a disaster. But when you take a step back and look in hindsight, it's not such a bad thing after all. And you come out of it, you come out of it stronger, you come out of it much better off. You learn so much more. I've learned so much since the last struck no, that I probably would never have bothered to learn if we hadn't, hadn't had to do that and if I hadn't decided that there was no way not on God's great green earth I was ever going to be left with no money ever again. So I guess I... I'm very old-fashioned in that view and I have been called on it numerous times. But cash, savings, two things you can't do without. Move to a cash budget, build savings. And that savings has to be cash savings and accessible. So, no, you can't do it as a mortgage redraw. You can't do it as investment property. You can, no, you need cash, move to a cash budget, and then you build. Once you've got 12 months of complete living expenses in a cash account, then if you want to invest, you go right ahead and do that. But you need 12 months of living expenses so that you are never, ever caught and struggling to put food on the table, to pay your mortgage, to pay the gas bill, pay the phone bill, you know, school fees or whatever it is. It is old fashioned and it's not what um, the um, gurus these days suggest. But we have cash, you have power, we have money in the bank you don't have the stress of worrying about day-to-day -day expenses and it's there when you need it. And then aim to be debt-free because I don't care what anyone says. When you have debt, and I don't care whether it's $5, $5,000, $5 million, you have debt, you own nothing. Until you are debt-free, you own nothing. So, yes. I'm old-fashioned I go against what everybody else is. But you, you save up. You want something, you save up for it. You don't put it on credit. You don't borrow for it. The only thing, the only debt anyone should ever have is their mortgage. And even then, if we weren't quite so precious about, you know, the types of homes we lived in and, and if we were prepared to do what our parents and our grandparents did and start off small and move up, We'd have less of a mortgage, pay it off faster, then you can improve and upgrade if you want to. Yeah. Kylie, what are my views on health insurance? We don't have private health insurance. We did talk about it a couple of years ago, um, getting just for me. We do have. A, our own version I guess is because we have a savings um, account that I bank into that pretty much was our health insurance and we use that I you know over the last few years I've had quite a few trips to hospital I've had, we've had quite a few expenses as far as medical goes and we've been able to I've Look, I've been able to pay for the private specialists, pay for the private treatment because we had that money in the bank. Now, private health insurance in Australia, I think, is 
is such a rip-off. It is so expensive. And there is very little, very little benefit to it. And with the changes that are being made, it's going to be even harder to benefit from it. It's going to be more expensive. You're going to have bigger excess and the actual benefits are going to be cut. So, you know, it, it's a really, it's a personal choice. I would never tell anyone to not have it. If you really want it, you go right ahead and you find a way to get that money and pay for it. I personally think it's the biggest ripoff and it's a rort and it really needs to be investigated and changed because it's insurance. So as far as I'm concerned, that alone being insurance should mean that if you are a loyal customer, you should get some sort of no claim bonus. If you don't use it for years and years and years, you should get something. There should be some benefit to you for being loyal and paying it um, without being whacked with a huge bill. And we've got the gap. It, it's just ridiculous. Private health insurance, I personally don't think is worth it. We have, um, we have a very good public hospital system. Now, in saying that, I can say that we're in Melbourne and I have, in the last three years, I've been admitted to Maroondah Hospital, Monash Medical Centre and Box Hill Hospital as a public patient each time without waiting, without question, without any problem at all. And the treatment has always been excellent. I have also been a patient in a little country hospital while we were away on one trip and I had a bit of a bit of a turn and ended up in a little country hospital. And again, I, I can't fault it, mind you, the doctor that was there and both nurses were all from Melbourne. So that was really nice. They were all Melbourneians. And um, again, the care, I can't fault it. I know my mother never had an issue with mum with public hospitals. So it's a very personal thing. But personally, from my point of view, private health insurance, big waste of time. Okay. How do I use Miracle Spray in the toilet while well, I slosh in and give it a scrub and a flush? Simple as that. Just like you would toilet duck or whatever. You spray bottle, go spray, 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 brush, flush. Um, good for you, Tanya. That's brilliant. Tanya's almost got her mortgage paid off. Yay! Amazing. All right. 12 months of living expenses. Well, what's included? Mortgage, gas, electricity, water, telephone, car registration, car insurance, house insurance, content insurance. If you've got private health insurance, private health insurance. You'll need food, um, petrol, school fees, clothing, whatever's on your budget for 12 months. That's pretty much what you have 12 months of living expenses. You won't do it quickly. It, it's not, um, it won't happen overnight. You will need to save up for it. Start, aim for a month. How much does it cost you to live for a month? Everything for a month. Then aim for three months, then aim for six months, and then aim for your 12 months. Do it in stages, but aim for a month. At the very least, aim for $1,000. If you've got $1,000 and something happens like the fridge breaks down or the washing machine floods the house and needs to be replaced, you've got the money there to do it. So aim for that at the very least. Yeah. yeah. Oh, two months and mortgage free. Are you going to have a party? Even if it's just like, you know, we call a party, a party, a bag of party mix, a packet of chips and a bottle of lemonade is a party in our house. But, you know, we celebrate. Celebrate. Do something exciting. Congratulate. Well, so that's two people who almost have their mortgages paid off. How's that? For, yay! Congratulations. 
Okay. You're 10 minutes over. Oh, sorry. Okay, I've been told I've got to go. I'm 10 minutes over. So just remember disasters aren't always disasters. You can do anything for a short time, even if it's eat wheat mix for dinner. We've done that before now. Still do and we still do occasionally, yep. So I would um oh, sorry folks, I've got this thing sticking up and I can't see. Um just say move to a cash budget, work out what your priorities are for your expenses and then your priorities for your lifestyle and make the changes you need to change need to. And who knows? It will be life-altering anyway, but it could set you on a whole new path to something great like it did for us. All right, so, all right. Okay, guys, Thursday, coffee scrolls or cinnamon scrolls and pizza scrolls. And it won't be too hot to have the oven on, so that will be nice. And I'll see you then. All right, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't. Like us, share. And um, we're almost to the 1,000 subscribers, so I'm really excited about that. It'll be really good to do that draw. I can't wait. Okay, I'll see you on Thursday. Bye.